<clears throat> okay, let's get started. Right, so, so we've spent a couple of classes already on basic formalisms of graphic models, directed and undirected, and we know how to do exact inference, and also we know how to do uh, maximum likelihood learning with or without observation. Okay, so these are all we've learned so far. So today, and maybe next lecture, I'm going to uh, converge a little bit and give you a few use cases, uh, starting from the very fundamental and the basic and famous one, and then to some modern cases. And the, today's lecture will be kind of dense because you will be seeing everything that we talked about so far not converging together, okay, for a single problem. And you saw some of, in fact, both of these models you've seen that before, but uh, in a very fragmented way. Today you are going to see the whole piece. HMM and the CRF. And these two models are actually hands in hand, okay? They actually are often used to solve the same problem based on slightly different principles and design philosophy. And let's see uh, how to conceive the model and how to actually uh, carry it through. So again, you know, every model is connected and we start from the very basic. We know this model already, right? This is a model we've seen in the EM algorithm for clustering. You have uh, a point cloud, which uh, you know, may fall into a few clusters and uh, the coordinates of uh, all these are actually represented by the observed variable x. And then you indicate, uh, you, you assign a indicating variable y to indicate which class they belong to, okay? <clears throat> now, this is the standard use cases for a classroom problem. I give you all the data points at one time. You are going to cluster them. I can turn the problem a little bit around, just the same problem. I gave you points one by one. So now you are a modeler or you are a problem solver, say you want to do financial applications to predict, you know, this stock, does it belong to finance or, in, or, or maybe uh, IT industry or, you know, uh, share economy and so forth. And I give you stock points one by one, every, maybe one point per day. Do you use the same algorithm or do you change? <clears throat> that actually is a, uh, a test for the, the kind of the experience or the savviness of uh, you know, a modeler. You know, if you go to a uh, industry to pick a job, how to impress your boss, you will say, okay, out of my pocket, I have not only just the EM algorithm for clustering or maybe a k-means, I have another algorithm. Maybe this is a model. Because data are presented to you one after another, it is uh, uh, at least not harmful to assume that uh, the way you are presenting the data, you are presented the data, uh, can be rhythmic or can be uh, uh, from certain patterns. For example, suppose these are just, you know, uh, locations, you know, in a city. And, uh, you know, when I give you one data point, um, the next data point are maybe more likely to be come from nearby rather than from a far apart place, right? Different corner of the city, I just fetch all over the place, give you random locations. Well, that's possible, but at least one scenario could be, I want to stay here, like I'm in Oakland for, for a while, and I sample a few people, then I drive downtown and I sample a few people, then I drive other places. Right? That's a natural assumption at least to make. If that's the assumption, then how is that assumption reflected in the model? Okay? That's the kind of the art of modeling. And that's where we could assume a hidden Markov model where you assume that the label or the cluster of uh, uh, the points have some temporal dependencies, okay? Maybe we have a simple temporal dependencies where you have a cell transitioning, where with a high probability I'm going to stay within the cluster, or with a small probability I'm going to move to the other cluster. So that kind of dependencies, right? So just with that piece of additional information, you've now, in a sense, unroll this model, which is a stack of uh, independent you know, observations 
to a sequence of dependent observations. So in a sense, HMM is just a temporal unfolding of a deck of independent data points. And the way they get connected is through the hidden variable wise. That's the error means, okay? And you see these examples already. For example, I gave you this example earlier in speech, right? Your utterance, you know, is temporal dependent. It is very hard, even physically, to pronounce two words which are completely very different, right? So the way you speak kind of have a pattern. And you can, and also our linguistic knowledge, our, you know, uh, language, you know, background can dictate us to speak in a certain way. You know, a verb follows a noun and so forth, right? So that basically leads you to a model like this. So this is called a hidden Markov model, and it is one of the earliest, you know, uh, so-called graphical models or multivariate models people use to uh, infer many problems. In fact, I believe early applications could uh, appear in the 60s or even 50s, although they never publish because it's in you know, cryptic, cryptic uh, applications like finance. But later on, when scientific data become more and more uh, public available uh, and the needing applications, especially in biology, you know, remember the, you know, uh, I think one of the great events in the 90s and uh, yeah, is a, the publication of the human genome. Now probably you can, you don't take that, you take that for granted already, right? Se sequence the human genome will cost maybe a couple hundred dollars and you get a day, you can basically get a shipment from 23andMe and I got a sequence. But uh, in the 90s, it's a huge project. It involves international collaboration of many labs, and uh, they basically dump into a center uh, storage, you know, the sequences. I was actually somehow involved uh, in one of these projects in Santa Cruz. You know, Professor David Hausler was uh, one of the two leaders leading the public efforts, you know, for human genome project. And there's also a private efforts Okay, and uh, uh, running in parallel, there was a bitter rivalry between these two. But put that aside, it turns out that in the end, they turn to the same technique to decode those sequences, which is to really, you know, the whole sequence of characters are just A, G, C, T, right? It doesn't mean anything. But uh, some may encode a gene, some may be the background sequences. So how to decode that? People actually use the HMM as well. The HMM states can represent within gene, outside of gene, or other functional elements like promoters and so forth, right? So this uh, event actually uh, popularized a great deal about uh, the application of HMM. There was a book called uh, Biological Sequence Analysis by Durbin, very, uh, also in the 90s. It became very famous. The whole book is written about HMM and all its variations, okay? So now let's uh, take uh, you know, a more rigorous look about the, what the HMM look like. It's a review. We actually talked about that before in my scripting, but now I typed it, okay? Here is a HMM and the, the basic uh, ingredients. You need to have uh, a observation, which is a sequence, and the sequence has to live in a state, a space. And in here, you can have an alphabetical set or Euclidean space, which, uh, you know, uh, depends on whether the observation is a discrete, uh, categorical, or real, right? So you have a space. You need to have uh, the hidden state. Usually it's uh, a discrete index state, or index sets, one to n. You can give names and uh, attributes to each of the index, you know, being different cluster names, locations uh, or functions inside the gene, or anything that you can attribute to. <clears throat> and then you define the transition probability from here to here, from here to here. And typically here, uh, there are some, uh, uh, you know, uh, convenient assumptions. For example, the first stage is kind of, transition is kind of unique. Actually, no, no, I'm not, um, I'm, uh, I'm talking about the transition Actually, uh, let's talk about the first, uh, second uh, in, the, in, the, in the next uh, step. So this is the transition from, uh, so that's the index. You can see this random variable Y has a subscript T, which indicates its uh, position in the sequence. And the, the subscript J, which, uh, or I, which index its uh, choice of states. 
And from i to j at time t, you know, is taking place at a probability alpha i j. Okay, and because uh, you know all the transitional events going out of j has to be you know uh, uh, sum to one, therefore this whole thing follows a multinomial probability distribution, right? And then there is also a starting probability. What's the state of the first y one? That's another, it's like in a graphic model, you have the root marginal. Okay, it could also take a multinomial with uh, these probabilities. And then there is also something called a emission probability, which defines the conditional probability of the observation given the hidden states. And uh, in this case, it could be a discrete observation like the coin tossing, right? Uh, but also it could be, this, uh, could be real, like uh, in the cluster example, you have the coordinates of the random variable, and then it could be, you know, a, uh, say a Gaussian or other continuous distribution indexed by the variable sets i, which kind of suggests it is coming from cluster i. Right, so this is the whole thing, basically you need to define a hidden Markov model. There is one caveat I want to remind you in here. I said it is, maybe I forgot one thing, it should be saying for all the t's. Okay, for all the different uh, time points, I'm going to use the same multinomial to define the transition. This is called a stationarity. It could also be non-stationary if every time you change your mind and use a different model. Then it will be a little bit harder to learn, okay? And we also knew this already. It's all about the review. I just want to put things together. You saw these illustrations before in different places already. So here, how to write down the joint, the probability of a parse, and also the states. Okay, you just follow the graphical model, and the factorization law tells you to multiply each little pieces, and that's how you multiply, right? So you should know that already, it's a review. And then once you do that, uh, we need to worry about the inference. And uh, one of the inference is uh, about uh, the posterior of a state given uh, you know, uh, the whole observation, okay? And uh, this is proportional to really the posterior of the y, or the joint of the yi, and also the sequence, right? And uh, we remember this uh, thing that uh, we walked through. You can do this by arranging the summation sign to get rid of all the other y's you don't care about, except the one you want to keep. And uh, in doing so, we apply a technique known as elimination, right? And you eliminate the following some order. In this case, you eliminate from uh, left to right, and uh, you are going to basically get rid of uh, y1, then y2, and so forth. And hopefully you still recall, in each of the elimination step, I'm going to be able to generate an intermediate term Okay, in this case it's uh, m y one. In this case it's m y two, and uh, in fact each term could give you this quantity, which is the probability of uh, a subsequence plus a state, right? And uh, once you reach all the way to the end, you will get this property. Okay, so this is uh, a elimination from uh, left to right. We also knew how to eliminate from the reverse direction, right? So these actually are two kind of uh, uh, very uh, raw cases of uh, two very well-known algorithms which are now written in a much more prettier and uh, maybe cleaner way, okay? Here is a famous algorithm in HMM known as the forward algorithm, and the goal is to compute the marginal of the x and uh, then the way to do that is to define an intermediate term, which is uh, called the alpha. And look at the alpha, what it stands. It stands this guy. The probability of a partial sequence up to time t ended with a state at k. Okay? And uh, this guy, after some derivation, follows a recursive function which is uh, alpha at time t, okay, for state k equals to 
the multiplication of uh, three things. Okay, this guy, and this guy, and that guy. What is this guy? This guy is the transition probability of uh, y t and y t minus one. Okay, from i to j, uh, i to k, something like that. If you walk through it a bit uh, more carefully, you will notice that uh, this term is actually exactly, you know, the elimination term we get earlier from uh, where? From here. Okay. I told you earlier that uh, there is a deep connection between elimination and the uh, message passing, and uh, the forward algorithm is actually a message passing algorithm. It tells you the following. It's a sum product rule. Okay, which uh, is telling you how to compute a message coming out of here, which is alpha t plus one. Okay, using message coming into here, which is alpha t. And uh, the alpha t plus one roughly takes a form, which is, uh, you know, three terms. You know, the, the previous message alpha t times the transition from here to here. T to T plus one, and also the emission P of uh, X T Y T, something like that. And now why this uh, summation is, uh, this Y is taken out? Because uh, this Y isn't affected by the summation sign, we can take it out, okay? So you remember this uh, definition of the sum product where the message outgoing is going to be the sum of product of all the messages coming in plus the local terms. Okay. So this is basically this forward algorithm is just you know, an instance of the message passing algorithm on HMM. And the beauty of this message is that after you've done enough, until you reach to the end, alpha capital T, then what you really have is basically this guy okay, at time t. And then the joint only needs you to sum over all the last states over k, and then you get the marginal. Okay, so message passing all the way to the end gets you to the marginal because all the hidden variables are eliminated. Okay. Likewise, the backward algorithm can be directly used to compute this guy. Okay. And you can see that here, uh, I'm writing it in a slightly different way to single out this uh, yt of k and uh, you can rearrange the turn a little bit. You can see that uh, this guy breaks down to the product of uh, this and that. Okay. What is this guy? If you stare at it clearly, uh, more closely. Do you recognize it? Mm -hmm. It is alpha TK, <clears throat> right? The probability of a half sequence at t plus one state, right? And this guy looks a little bit more complicated, conditional, you know, uh, the, the probability of uh, the later half of the sequence conditioning on the earlier part and also the state. What do we need all this? If you look at a graphical model, it is about the, the conditional of uh, uh, this part for this part and this part, right? and this part. So the truth is that uh, if you knew all this already, all this doesn't matter because it's irrelevant. You have this mark of uh, deseparation property. Therefore, all this can be crossed out. Okay, that's again the nice thing about the graphical models. You can, you can visually see it and simplify your equation. And this term actually defines, you know, actually it's very similar to the message we created in our backward elimination, if you go back a few pages. And in fact, in the literature, it has a name called the beta probability, a beta term, the backward message, okay? And this backward message also has a recursive term like this, because uh, 
it follows basically the generic message passing definition. If you have a message coming this way, then you use a message from here and here and the, the local, which exactly are the, these three terms. The, the previous message, okay, and uh, the transition, and also the emission. Okay, don't get wrong, this is not alpha. This is uh, A, the transition probability between the two states, okay? So, what do we get now? So, we basically are saying that the earlier examples of elimination, you know, is uh, more elegantly and generally defined as uh, message passing on a tree of order graph, and they are recursively defined by the sum product formula. And in fact, if you go even bigger and back, remember that uh, for arbitrary graphic model, we can turn them into a junction tree which we didn't cover, but uh, just to show you, in the case of HMM, the junction tree look like the same as the HMM, except that now I put all these little terms more explicitly in here, so that you can you know, work on how to put them together. And the right word passage, message passing, you know, in this formula, you know, this is the local fragment I just uh, kind of circled, now it made it more formal, this message, coming out of here is uh, due to the multiplication of uh, this message, that message, plus this local term. Okay, so that's exactly the sum product algorithm. And uh, when you do rearrangement, they look the same as the forward algorithm. So all these techniques with all these different names actually are the same, okay, at least on HMM. But uh, you can take this idea here, which is not limited to only HMM to any junction tree algorithm, you know, in, in the case that you have a bigger graphic model down the road. Backward algorithm, likewise. So this is a like review, so that you know everything we talked so far now come together in the case of HMM. So just to clue, conclude here as a summary, the forward algorithm is a message passing, you know, rightward, and it is also equivalent to elimination from head to tail. Backward is a message passing in the reverse direction. It's also equivalent to a elimination from reverse direction. Once you have all these, you can do a lot of cool things. Okay, you can do a lot of things, in fact, uh, even real time. For example, this thing, the arbitrary you know, uh, you know, conditional probability of any states, hidden states, given the whole sequence, is uh, really equivalent to the product of uh, a alpha message and a beta message met at time t. Okay. So in practice, when you want to do, you know, uh, you know, uh, a inference of uh, this uh, y t state, you literally need to collect message up to here and up to here from either direction. Once they meet, you already solve the problem. But if you bother to take the message all the way to the end and all the way to that end, what you get is basically this uh, gamma t of i for all the t's and all the i's. That's also good. It becomes a probabilistic database that answers you all the queries in a sequence. Okay? Now, a slightly uh, trickier question. What if I want to ask a p of a y t i and y t plus one j? given the whole sequence. The joint of a pair. <laughs> Do you have any idea? I guess you wouldn't say that I'm going to just uh, multiply this twice, right? Because that doesn't, that's assuming the two states are independent, then you can jointly multiply them. They are dependent. So you need to do a little bit more work and uh, come up with uh, a slightly more variations it turns out that it's still a message passing, but with more terms, okay? I'm not going to work it out, but uh, you can kind of uh, uh, figure out. In a sense, it's becoming a uh, larger message, you know, uh, in here, t and y, t plus one, and then coming in, coming in, and coming up. You can just collect all these messages and normalize them. That's the kind of rough, rough idea. And hopefully you can find that uh, this equation is doing exactly that for you. Okay, so uh, now I want to just say one last word. In practice, when you 
um, uh, write your program. In fact, uh, if I'm the engine, uh, if I'm the engineer manager in a uh, AI company, I probably will give you a quiz in the, if you apply for a job and ask you to write a HMM. Okay, and uh, if you happen to write a HMM, there are a few catches that I kind of can test you how well you exactly know this model and how you are really coming out of a book knowledge or you have a pragmatic knowledge. You know how I, I, can, I can literally test that. Okay, and here is one such test. You know, in my lab or in many languages, writing many loops are very, very difficult, right? For example, here, you, are, you need to loop over T, you need to loop over K, and the double loop over I and J and so forth, right? But you also know that in any language, doing matrix multiplication and manipulation are much cheaper than looping. You don't have to address everything, right? This whole thing actually can be written down in a complete matrix language. Because what is beta? beta Basically, for all the t, it's basically a slice. Let's call beta t, for example. It's basically a list, an array of uh, the beta t at all the little states. And the alpha, same thing, it is a vector. Okay. You actually could uh, easily achieve uh, you know, the vector in one operation if uh, you do the math right. And uh, here are basically you know, uh, the formula. For example, in here, how to get the vector alpha it is equal to this A matrix, transpose A is the transition matrix, remember the whole thing, and the multiply, right multiplied with the, the alpha vector uh, from the previous time point. Okay, so this whole thing will give you what? A vector, right? Matrix multiplied, right multiplied by you know, a, uh, you know, a, uh, a, uh, a vector. So that's a vector. And then you are going to do what? Okay. You are going to now again um, this B matrix. B is uh, the emission matrix. You are going to then collapse with that as well. Okay, to get uh, basically another vector. And likewise for the beta and this, this. this are, in fact, this dot thing is very interesting. It's not a dot product. It is an element-wise multiplication. For example, you can literally mirror what's happening here to what is happening here. Here, for one state, you have a, a you know, element-wise product of alpha and beta message for state K. And here you just do it as a whole vector of a, you know, uh, element-wise production or multiplication, you get the whole vectors. Okay. So this is a one caveat where the whole HMI inference, in fact, can be written less than 10 lines of code, maybe five lines, okay, just to get the entire sequence of states taken care of. So there's another caveat I'm going to mention a little bit later, but uh, uh, I want to touch upon a few more subjects before I get that point. So I want to say a few more words about posterior decoding. So we knew how to now write down the posterior of a single state given the whole sequence already, right? Using the alpha beta algorithm. And uh, by taking the argmax, you can also derive what is the most probable state at a particular sequence, a particular time point. Uh, so this is the MPA of a single hidden state. And how to get the MPA of uh, a pair of states? Do we just do two rounds of uh, yt and the two rounds of y, oh, another round of one, t plus one, and uh, get the t state and the t plus one star? Do we do that? I wanted to write very quickly, right? To get a sense about what is, a, what is a joint assessment, what is the isolated assessment. So it is correct or not. If I want to have the, okay, it is not, right? Because uh, we already have an example before. For example, here, when we ask for the joint 
state estimation, it is very different from asking every state individually, right? So what we need to do is to compute basically P of Yt, T plus one, given the whole thing, and then you can pick out the joint configuration of a pair jointly. So what if I want you to ask, uh, to answer the joint estimation of the whole sequence? That's a little bit tricky, right? Because that means you need to now write down the whole thing. Do you want to do that? Do you think this is the right way to do it? Because you know, naturally we do this already, this is not right, and this is right, then this must be right, right? Can you do this? Please speak up. <clears throat> we need to be very quick in here. Just like Jeopardy, for example. I, I, I close to this question, you, you got 30 seconds. What do you do? <clears throat> or maybe if you do this, what, what, uh, what uh, uh, trouble you are going to run into? So think as a computer scientist, you know, our Former chair in here, Jeanette Wynn, used to say that we need to do computational thinking, okay, not a human brain thinking. Okay. Computational thinking means that uh, you need to register into some memory, pick it out, and then do some kind of uh, you know, operators on, on each of the register and uh, piece together the puzzles and so forth. Now, where do you store this? This is a whole posterior of a long sequence given the whole observation. Have you thought about that? Here, it looks like an equation, but in computer, it has to be stored. How do you store that? Right. So that's defining the differences between a statistician and a computer scientist. We do computational thinking. Every number has to be stored or has to be retrievable. Right? And therefore, this algorithm isn't working because you cannot store it. It's too expensive. It's exponentially expensive to store this whole thing. Right? And that comes to the billion dollar invention, you know, known as the Viterbi algorithm, okay? Which uh, is clever enough, I'm not going to walk you through, it's very, very trivial not to derive it once you know the sum product and the elimination and so forth. But the key idea comes to the point that uh, they start to discover a recursion, okay? First of all, a partial answer, okay? The partial answer basically uh, is, uh, you know, uh, uh, let's see. <clears throat> is this. The probability of the most likely sequence of states ending at somewhere. Okay. I basically, you know, begin by having a partial answer up to here and also, you know, uh, giving the choices, you know, for the last time point over all the possible case, okay? So that means one sequence plus, you know, the tail to be having K options, okay? And uh, this partial sequence can grow from sequence one, just having one state to two. And uh, the genius part is that it turns out that there is a interesting recursion, okay? The longer, the bigger partial sequence, okay, probability is, uh, you know, a function of uh, that partial sequence, just one kind of uh, position shot multiplied by this and this plus a operator. Okay. So this recursion is called by Turby. Basically, it allows you to do this. I'm going to now settled from, suppose that I'm in the middle of this problem already, I already knew <clears throat> up to now, up to three, the best partial sequence is uh, this part, this guy, three, 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 okay? Then I need to desert, determine what is uh, my fourth position is to be the best. And also, I need to guarantee that when I choose this already, then there's no regret. When I finish the whole thing, this is still the best state, okay? That's the whole point. 
And it turns out that there are all these different choices I'm going to, 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 uh, to uh, pick. And I'm going to pick according to this, okay? Basically, all these potential options given in here, multiplied by the transition, multiplied by the emission, I'm going to pick one of the best out of that. And then I can grow one step further. Okay, maybe here, and then I go all this again. You can see, every time I grow, I, I keep a partial sequence, I leave myself k options, it is a polynomial algorithm, not exponential. Okay, it is polynomial in the sense that it is a k times n, rather than n to the power of k. Right, so it's not computatorial. So this is called a Viterbi algorithm, and the, the key is this iteration, which is very similar to the alpha and the beta iterations we saw before, except that now the summation sign is replaced by a max. Okay. So go home and stare at it for a while, and then hopefully you can uh, appreciate uh, uh, the cleverness. There's a derivation in here, a very, very simple derivation, but uh, I'm not going to walk through that today. You can actually, if you are curious, you can show it to yourself. It's a, literally a single one-page derivation. And once you reach to the end of this whole thing, once you have uh, you know, the Viterbi of uh, T of K, then it's very easy, right? You just uh, pick you know, out of that K options one time again, you get the whole thing. This algorithm is, uh, uh, you know, University of Southern California has a, uh, their college of engineering is called the Viterbi College of Engineering, right? And it is named after this guy. This guy was the co-founder of Qualcomm, made a good fortune, and, uh, and donated a, 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 you know, a whole uh, engineering school. And this guy was also somehow connected to myself because uh, he was the high school classmate of uh, my uh, uh, PhD, one of my PhD mentors, uh, Professor Richard Karp. Because they were high school colleagues. Okay, very, very interesting. Uh, I don't know which one, which life you prefer. One become a Turing Award winner, the other become a billionaire and founding a, uh, a college of engineering. I don't know which one you want to go. <laughs> Maybe both, right? <laughs> well, you know, uh, David Patterson actually achieved both, won the Turing Award and also, you know, become very rich and uh, influential in industry. So these are doable. I think that's the privilege of being a computer scientist. So now, uh, without, with all the joke going away, there's another catch I want to uh, teach you uh, so that you show very nicely to your interviewers to start your entrepreneur dream, okay? If you implement this whole thing, for example, this table needs to be stored. And uh, you may notice that, uh, you know, uh, the thing that is stored, you know, this message, probabilistically or mathematically correspond to this guy. It's a multiplication of a whole bunch of things, <laughs> okay? And there, you will actually see that when you implement this, you will run into some trouble. You will run into very quickly a data underflow issue. Once you apply, you know, multiply something that is between zero and one, and you multiply it 100 times, that number vanishes. You never get it, okay? But it's still a number, okay? You, you, have, you, don't, you cannot assume it to be zero. And you need to reuse it at some point to compare, basically, which one is bigger, you know, to pick out the best sequence. Okay. And that number usually is a 10 to the power of minus 100 or something like that. Therefore, if you really store them in uh, floating numbers, you don't really get, you know, the precision. So the trick is that instead of uh, defining this message, you need to take a logarithm of that to make them the sum of the log of the message rather than the product of the original numbers. So that matrix, matrix application multiplication we need to be augmented a little bit to put a log there to turn some of the product into a summation. So that's the other trick that you guys want to figure out, maybe in one of our homeworks. Okay? That will guarantee you to pass that examination uh, for a, uh, probably an interesting uh, ML engineer position. All right, any questions so far? So we very, very quickly run through you know, HMM and inference. Yeah, the question about the biggest byte. Mm -hmm. um, the part about the log. Yeah. <clears throat> was there supposed to be a log on the machine in the bottom layer? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's the question? <clears throat> hmm. Good question. That's probably true. No, because uh, this V is already the log of that. Okay. Yeah, but like anyway, um, you know, uh, this little little edge break thing could be a good teaser or homework that you guys can stare at it. Uh, we 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 unless uh, it's becoming serious, so we hopefully don't need to resolve that here because I myself may get confused. Just a quick excuse here. Okay, so now let's uh, move on. I think this one doesn't have to be going through. We already know that uh, some product algorithm is uh, polynomial, so you can now stare at all these iterations and hopefully convince yourself that for each of that, the complexity is this much, okay? In fact, I have two complexities. One is time complexity, the number of multiplication summations you have to do, which usually is uh, quadratic to the, uh, to the states and the linear to the length of the sequence. Then there is also a space complexity, how much space you need to take to store the whole thing. And in this case, you only need to store the alpha vector the beta vector, which are k lengths long, and that's it. Okay, very, very easy. Okay, so very quickly, uh, let's look at the learning and uh, uh, just learning. We have all the ingredients already, so we literally don't need to work too much <coughs> uh, on the learning part. Supervised learning, meaning that you have uh, x and y all observed. And uh, here, let's take a few assumptions to make the learning even less painful. One assumption is known as a parameter sharing. Remember that uh, this guy requires a uh, probability, the initial probability, and the transitions need a probability. And by applying the assumption of a stationarity, I say that the A transition matrix will apply to all the steps, okay? And if that's the case, you know, you again, you write down the whole thing and uh, then you take a maximum likelihood estimation that gives you something very trivial, which tells you that uh, the transition is just uh, the rate, okay, occurring between the two states over all the transitions you can, you can see, you know, uh, in every time stamp. So it's becoming a count counting exercise. Well, I'm going to say a little bit more about uh, uh, some uh, uh, smoothing technique. For example, what if you see no transition between two states, you know, in your limited sequence of observations? And uh, here's an equation which I'm going to explain in a second. The previous one only think about uh, the A transition matrix, which is uh, the Markov model only. And now we have a hidden Markov model, meaning that uh, you have not only this, but also this part which means that uh, you need to worry both the transition matrix and also the emission matrix. Same thing, it's very, very easy once you're all observed. Here, the transition is just uh, a counting between the state transitions between two Ys divided by all the transitions out of you know, the Y. And here, you are using the Y as a delta function to pick the observation X coming from that state and then you are going to divide by the total number of uh, transitions or states in Y, and that gives you the frequency of observing the, the X observation coming out of a particular Y state. So these are just the different ways of counting your numbers, okay? And uh, it's a frequency estimation. And uh, now supervised learning has uh, some kind of uh, uh, in the deficiency which is uh, known as overfitting. Suppose that, for example, you are learning a spelling model, okay? The transitions between all the, uh, you know, uh, the 26 characters, right? And uh, if uh, you just uh, see, uh, you know, say a, th a, th a thousand word in your, in your training set, chances for you to see a uh, Z to Z transition may be very small, maybe zero. You don't see that just because you don't count enough words yet. 
then what is the probability estimation of a P of a Z to Z? Zero, right? And that means that uh, in the future, when you see something like a dazzling or whatever, you know, double Z uh, spelling, it will all come that as uh, an error. That's probably not smart, right? So this technique is known to be uh, uh, trouble-worthy, uh, troublesome, and therefore uh, people invent a few tricks. Uh, one of the tricks is uh, called, uh, has a good name called uh, Zudo Counts. You know, here is another example in our you know, casino example. You see all the Fs, therefore there are no fair dead dice. Then you again have a uh, wrong estimation. So the zero count basically says that uh, I'm going to you know, uh, uh, plug in some imaginary numbers, maybe one only, just to avoid the zero probability, no matter what. Everything is possible, albeit with sometimes a very small probability. So that's called the zero count. And uh, this doesn't sound like very nice. People, you know, sometimes say, no, okay, why not two, why not three? And uh, or maybe this whole business is just a hack. Uh, let's you know, justify pseudo counts and so forth. Right? Uh, I bet you know this story already in our 701 or other classes, right? So pseudo counts can be, uh, you know, more kind of polished and theoretically defended using a Bayesian theory where you basically introduce a prior of your numbers. Okay? The prior you know, uh, puts uh, some uh, you know, imaginary counts on any events. And then the posterior is a combination of the prior and the data. If the data become very, very dominant, then the effect of the prior will be eliminated. Otherwise, you rely on the prior to rescue you. So these are the stories I don't plan to cover here, but you should know it. So after you have all that, then you can basically you know, uh, put down you know, the estimation you know, uh, using the zero counts, which I believe is uh, you know, uh, just giving you, you know, some additional extra weights, okay, where the, 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 the augmentation can be computed in this equation. Again, very quickly, I do want to finish quickly to run into the other very interesting model. The unsupervised learning, EM algorithm. Uh, someone want to give me a hint about what that is about? When you have the Y sequence unobserved, what do you do? Just now when I do counting, I assume Y is unknown, X unknown, everything is known. Right? In here, if Y is not known, what do you do? Just give you a reminder. So in, even in our general, you know, graphic modulation network inferences, when everything is known, you just do counting. What if uh, my Y's are not known? Give it a try. I see where I'm getting. You are helping the class to kind of reinventing this whole theory about, you know, uh, uh, doing expected complete likelihood, and then do all the revisions. Remember, at the end of the day, what do we get? We have an EM step, right? In the E step, we re we replace the sufficient statistic of everything. Uh, if there is a hidden variable with their expectation, right? And uh, in the M, we just treat everything to be assumed to be observed, right? So that's the exact expect the result of us moving some out of log and taking lower bounds and all that, right? So that actually leads to a very, very simple operation. Again, there's a name for that, von Welsh algorithm. It is like this. So again, yeah, just to recap, 
In the supervised case, we have all that. In the unsupervised case where y is missing, we do that as the loss. But these math are kind of hairy. Maybe you don't even want to derive that, but now let's look at what it leads to. In the supervised case, we have all these. Okay. In the unsupervised cases, these are missing, these are missing, and this whole pair are missing. Fine. We just replace them with all that. Okay, this, uh, this uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, triangular bracket uh, is, uh, you know, the physics is the way of uh, expressing an expectation, and that requires to compute the posterior of uh, one hidden state or a pair of hidden states given the whole sequence because the expectation is taking over the posterior. And what is this? We started that before. Right? Our forward-backward algorithm, our elimination algorithm are giving us these uh, inference results. So now you see the EM part. The E basically take the inference as a subroutine, okay, and replace the unknown with their expectation. And then they become known. Therefore, in the originally fully observed MLE cases, these terms are now replaced with uh, their expectations. In this case, the gamma. In this case, the cosine. Right? Then you get uh, this uh, alpha and uh, uh, A and uh, B, which are the transition emission probabilities. But remember, just like in the k-means, it is not a one-time kind of deal. Because you have this uh, parameter estimation now, your estimation of the posterior will change now. It's a, it's a newer model. You need to now re-estimate this then re-estimate this and uh, do the EM iteratively until they converge. Just like in the, in the mixed up Gaussian model EM. Right? So this is the E step, this is the M step. So this algorithm is known as the von Welsh algorithm. So you can see they all have these names, Viterbi algorithm, von Welsh, forward and backward. They were all independently or dependently invented by all different folks during different time. And uh, that's the the cost you pay before people adopt this uh, graphic model generic formalism. And now this business is gone, okay? Now with the graphic model, no one ever need to invent any new algorithm. They are all the same algorithm now. You will see in the future. All right, so um, I have uh, 20 minutes. I think that should be good to present you at least you know, another interesting model. Um, so we are good with HMM, hopefully, right? We know the inference, we know the semantics, we know the learning. And we know the application. Application is about uh, modeling sequential data, making predictions on hidden sequences. Right. So are we done? Are, you know, are, there, are people happy with that? Well, I will give you an example where people are not very happy. Okay. There are some caveats with this model. So people listed uh, at least uh, these uh, two uh, shortcomings of uh, HMM already. And there, along the way, there are intermediate inventions called the MEM model, maximum entropy model, and so forth, which uh, is partially addressing that, but uh, not quite. So I, I, I just want to ignore that and directly jump to one of the best solutions answering all this. So in here, one of the first question is this uh, uh, lack of ability to capture global knowledge. For example, you know, uh, these transitions and these emissions are all very local. You know, it's really about, the, hey, I saw a word A in the previous word, and then I want to predict the next word. I'm going to only see that, right? Uh, there, I don't see the context. Okay, someone say, oh yeah, maybe the problem is because you are using a first order Markov. How about I use second order? Maybe uh, making the dependency like that you know, your word next will be depending on now the present word and one step before, that kind of thing. Maybe okay, but it again makes the cost bigger because uh, the joint states of a pair will be, you know, quadratic, right? So that's not quite a solution. And people even ask more. The global isn't necessarily just the words. What if uh, I saw this a whole paragraph italic or in a parenthesis, about faced and so forth? You know, NLP, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, applications are quite uh, nuanced. There are a lot of uh, implications you read, you know, outside of the words, and they could also impact the way you do reasoning, especially emotional, sentimental analysis, and all that. Depends a lot of things like this. So there is an inability for HMM 
systematically capture such a non-local knowledge. Okay, that's one, one uh, uh, you know, uh, issue. The other issue is more kind of philosophical. It may or may not be truly impactful, but it is an issue. Okay. In HMM, what we are trying to learn is either to maximize the joint of X and Y if you see the wholly observed sequence, right? And or if uh, you don't see the whole sequence, you maximize the P of X, the observations, right? But when you use HMM, what you want to do is to try to make predictions out of a Y given X. So this thing is uh, different from what you actually use for learning. Okay, it's kind of a, a detour. It's like, uh, uh, how should I say? Uh, you want to go to DC, now you take a train to New York and then take a train back to DC, that, that kind of story, right? Rather than you directly go to DC, right? So people are bothered by, by, by this. This is the, uh, a, a debate uh, happening earlier in the history on whether we use discriminative model like this or generative model like this. If your task is discriminative, do I care about the model in the joint and all these debates? Okay. So that was the issue. But uh, these are philosophical. Then people actually come up with a, uh, a real kind of challenging example uh, for the HMM people uh, uh, to embarrass them. Okay. I remember uh, this example was very good. It was, it was written in this uh, very famous uh, John Lafferty and uh, Andrew McCallum paper, which was written here, by the way, at CMU. At that time, I was a student at Berkeley. And uh, my group uh, spent a week reading that paper and uh, got quite confused and read many times, do all the derivations on the board, together with Michael Jordan, a few students, David Bly, Andrew Ying, and so forth. We're all together and do, doing all this reading. And uh, then finally we figured out, oh, this is really an ingenious model. It was so clean and uh, powerful. So why this example was so interesting? So it's called the labeling bias problem. So let's look at uh, this problem. It looks like very harmless, but uh, there are some bigger issues that bothers the linguist. John Lafferty was not only a ML person, he is also a NLP person. So he actually knew the application, not as uh, just a shallow data set. He actually knew knew the, the semantics and the principles behind it. So imagine we have uh, this uh, uh, problem of space where you have a bunch of hidden states, okay? And uh, you have a bunch of uh, observations. And uh, every hidden state has uh, a transition probability out, right? They need to go to the next state. For example, in this uh, state A, it goes to the two next states with uh, this probability breakdown. What do we see? Well, it seems to be always uh, preferring to go to the next state, go to the second state, okay? And uh, then the next state, state two, also has some probability going out. Instead of going to two states, it goes to uh, five states, and with uh, all this breakdown. Uh, in here, it has an equal probability of going to all five, and in the next step, I don't know. Yeah, it has a slightly higher probability of staying at two and some probability of going to one and so forth. Okay, so this is just a model. In fact, in language, people always see that. For example, if you begin with a character R, you go to some other states. If you begin with a character I, you go to some other states. If you begin with a very unpopular state like a Z, you go to fewer states, right? So things like that. Now, what's the implication, you know, uh, by using all these local numbers? Okay, so here are some high-level summary. State one always uh, prefers to go to state two, almost always. And uh, state two almost always prefer to stay at the sequence two. Okay, that's the high-level observation. And uh, a, uh, a uh, human, an individual who look at all this will have a uh, synthesis process to get knowledge, oh, okay, this may be correspond to rare character, this other correspond to common character, when I do spelling check and so forth, I will see this whole thing, okay, in my mind. But now, 
it turns out that if you use a HMM model, something strange can happen. The HMM model is about uh, computing the joint probability of uh, a whole sequence, right? So let's look at, uh, you know, under HMM, what's the probability of a path, okay? So here, the probability of a path of a one, 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 you can calculate it. It's a 0.09, okay? And uh, so we'll put it there. And pass two, 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 okay? You can also calculate it. And uh, well, this is 0.01 or 0.02, okay? It's a bit smaller, quite smaller, in fact. And let's try a few other things. Maybe uh, one, two, one, two. You can also compute and uh, it gives you uh, 06. And uh, maybe you can try one more, uh, 1, 1, 2, 2. Okay, 0. 0.066. Okay, so, so many, uh, you can try a bunch of other things. You will actually convince yourself that uh, after all, the past probability has its maximum value at 1, 1, 1, 1. It will never get you to other combinations. So isn't that a bit strange? That my intuition says that uh, when I'm in state one, I have a bigger probability of moving into two. But, and also when I am in state two, I have a bigger probability of staying in two. But somehow when I compute the whole thing, I never get to state two anymore. I will stuck myself in state one. Is that mysterious? It's a very puzzling example. It only happens when you put the numbers there. But when you stare at the formula, you don't actually see those. Okay, it's not very intuitive. So this is called the very famous labeling bias problem. And you can kind of get a sense about uh, uh, what that implies to, uh, in that paper, they say, when you do spelling check, there is a word called the rib, and there is a word called the rob, and uh, you will find that uh, once uh, your second one is in I, in, in rib, uh, you, you, you never get all of it. You will always conclude that the rib is more probable than rob, even though we imagine rob is a much, much more common term, at least in natural text, right? because it's a human, it's a person's name. So what is the reason behind it? Right? So that's the, the point. It's because of the locality issue, the localness okay, of the probability uh, elements is uh, making you surprisingly biased. So where is the localness? In state two, state two is kind of a, you can imagine this is a eccentric, you know, uh, uh, a intrinsic guy, you know, who just don't talk to people too much. He has only two friends, okay? Therefore, these two neighbor has to share or split all the probabilities of his engagement. Therefore, you know, even for state one, which is not that very popular, it gets a share of a point four, uh, a point four, and the next one gets point six. So I'm talking about here. Okay, so it makes uh, you know uh, state one sound very popular. In fact, you know, point four is not a small number, even though it is smaller than the next uh, option, but it is still a big number compared to all these other things. The state two, which is a popular guy who wants to talk to many people, well, his bandwidth, uh, you know, with any particular guy, you know, is inevitably smaller. Okay, he likes, you know, uh, going to two most, but still only has 0 0.02, uh, 0.02 or 0.03 probability, right? And you can imagine that if I compare now this number with that number this O3 with this, it looks like this state actually is less likely, even though this is my best friend. Okay, I still see less tendency of going to that person, you know, uh, you know compared to state one. Okay. In a sense, you are comparing, you know, the, the chicken, to, uh, no, maybe apple to orange. You are comparing the stickiness of a eccentric guy to a person to the stickiness of a eccentric person to a particular guy. And these two things shouldn't be even compared. Right. There should be a global definition of the friendship, that uh, you know how friendly you are and uh, how 
you know, uh, likable and uh, how sociable you are and so forth. It's, these numbers should be globally defined rather than locally defined. But in here, the HMM only allows a local definition. So by doing HMM, you cannot escape from that. Because in HMM, the way you define a model is always about P of X, P of X given Y, and all that. They have to be locally normalized. Okay. Now, the solution is the following. <clears throat> Instead of uh, uh, you know, adopting a local kind of a probability definition, which is due to normalization of all the locals. Basically, local normalization means that uh, this number and this number have to, norm, have to norm to one. Otherwise, they cannot be called a probability. Right? So alternatively, I will just uh, use a global definition, which I call potential. Okay, then I will say that, uh, yes, you know, here I have a potential of 20 and 30. Here I have all these other potentials and so forth. Okay, therefore, at least here I have a 30 and here I have a 30. They are comparable. Okay, even though, you know, in a local normalization way, they actually, you know, have uh, the other kind of uh, uh, relative scales. But in here, they become really comparable. And then I'm going to now define the probability of this whole thing globally using some kind of uh, partition function that we used before. Okay. So that's actually achieved only when you are willing to turn a model into an indirect graphical model. Okay. So that actually leads to this uh, new model known as the conditional random field. So I copied, you can probably see that this morning, actually I changed the slides quite a bit just to give you visual aids to contrast the definition. In here, my older definition of HMM is based on the factorization rule. The factorization is over local conditionals and local marginals. And in here, I directly define the conditional. That's one already advantage. I can directly define conditional. And then the way I define conditional is to use a whole bunch of uh, potential functions, okay, weighted potential functions. Okay. And I don't worry about their local normalizability. I just care about the numbers of potential. And then this Z is going to take care of all the potential normalization. Just to give you a little more flavoring here, these potential functions can be defined, you know, remember, on cliques, right, in a graph. And in here, what are the cliques? Well, we have uh, the pairwise clique, we have the nodal clique, and remember that all these cliques should remember, should include the observations, which are no longer random variable, they're just features. Right. So therefore, for every pairwise potential, every single potential, I make them as a function of the x. So what's good about that? Well, the good thing is that the x is the whole text. You really can define, oh, if there is uh, uh, two paragraphs of bold face text, I need to you know, define a, a dependency in a certain way, and so on and so forth. You can be very flexible in putting the potential functions using both local, which is uh, this to this, this is local, this is local, but also the global information, okay? And then you don't worry about the normalizability on every local term, okay? And then this becomes you know, a very, very uh, nicely uh, feature-based model. Sometimes people call it a feature-based model. It allows you very powerful composition, uh, com compositionality, you know, for uh, model creation. Okay. All right. So that's the model. Okay. Just walking away from the local conditionals and the uh, marginals into local features, pairwise features, sometimes called edge features, and nodal features, and then of course two sets of weights. Okay. All right. And uh, now you have a model. They have a model which defines you now P of Y given X. Okay. And uh, we can same ask the question, how do we do inference? You know, for example, what is the maximum uh, sequence of a Y? Well, that part I want to borrow our earlier knowledge. We have a uh, almost identical algorithm as Viterbi to do posterior decoding which I'm not going to put in here. 
inference basically you know on on, on this is uh, you know, remember when I when when we talk about the message passing when we talk about junction tree we didn't actually specify whether it is directed or undirected right it's a tree and the, the message will pass all the way around and this one is a tree it's the same as HMM therefore you just do message passing on this as well now the message is the local potentials okay so we have the inference algorithm the same alpha and beta algorithm and perturbate algorithm in HMM can apply to here, no change, okay? Learning is a little bit tricky. That's something I want to say a few words. This is a fully observed learning problem. Let's assume for simplicity. Let's say these are wholly observed. And my learning task is to estimate lambda and the mu maximizing the conditional likelihood, okay? Now, if we remember the supervised learning, by the way, this is supervised learning because uh, everything is observed. The Y sequence are given. The X are already known. It looks like we can do maximum likelihood estimation uh, with uh, a single one shot, right? Just like count the frequency and so forth. Well, unfortunately, that's not going to be working for CRF. So remember, I, I, I bragged about all the advantage of CRF being advantageous over HMM, you know, for non-local features, for uh, non-local normalizability, and so forth. Remember, there is no free lunch in the world. You have to pay a cost, okay? Something has to happen to offset those convenience. Uh, it turns out that learning is one of these uh, caveat. That, uh, you know, count-based uh, MLE algorithm isn't going to work. Where, you know, in MLE for fully observed data, you don't need to do inference, right? To just do one shot maximum likelihood estimation. In here, it turns out that when you take this as a loss function and you take a derivative over all this, you get this. The gradient of the loss with respect to your parameters has this a very interesting expression. Here is the value of your feature or your potential, which actually can be counted from your data. Right? These are literally your, your, your data frequency of the feature. But in here, you have an expectation of the same thing. Now you assume that these Ys are not observed, and you need to take an expectation of all the Ys. Okay? So counting and also expectation. The differences between them defines the gradient. Therefore, even when you observe all the Ys already, in one of these steps, you need to still pretend they are not observed and you need to do expectation. So supervised learning in CRF or in undirected graph model in general requires you to do inference, okay? No matter what, okay? So that's actually the cost you need to pay. But is this really hard, doing this inference? Well, it turns out that it's not that hard, right? We already knew that uh, we have the sum product algorithm, <clears throat> and, uh, and uh, this is just to rework you with the elimination technique of uh, arranging the summations. It turns out that you know, uh, this, uh, you know, uh, you know, this expectation of uh, a pair of random variable over the entire hidden sequence is just equivalent to the expectation of this you know, over the marginal you know, posterior of a pair given the whole thing. This is, uh, remember, the cosine message that we computed before in HMM, right? And uh, in CRF, the inference is uh, the same as HMM in terms of the, the sum product or the message passing product. Okay? Therefore, this is tractable. It is not a exponential algorithm. It is a polynomial algorithm. Therefore, what you do is to very, very uh, strangely running an EM algorithm now, even for the observed cases, where you infer, you know, the Zs, uh, you know, uh, and other, the, 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 the lambda and the mu based on our current gradient, okay, which is uh, the differences between the feature and the expected features. Right, and expected features can be computed from this alpha 
message passing algorithm we actually show you an example. This is the same as in HMM. And then you can basically uh, use this to compute this gradient. I believe it is in here. Yeah. Okay. So this part and this part. Okay, so this is essentially a gradient descent algorithm, but uh, now uh, taking the uh, the process like a EM procedure, and you are going to keep iterating until convergence. And there is a learning rate that you can play with to uh, control the rate of convergence. That's not something we're going to discuss in here. It's a very, very uh, heuristic. Okay. Um, and there are a few other ideas to augment it, which I'm not going to cover because they are just algorithmic tricks. All right, so I think uh, that's all about today. You know, you may wonder, after all this work, do you really get something out of it? Uh, you know, is CRF, after all, so powerful or, or so forth? Well, at least the, the early papers are somewhat disappointing. This is a graph I copied from the early paper. You can see that uh, they are almost comparable. Okay, for different problems. Well, the argument is that uh, maybe they are slightly better. In fact, they are sometimes slightly worse, the error. Okay, these are synthetic examples where, you know, you assume that there are local dependencies and stickiness between words and so forth. That kind of uh, uh, labeling bias scenarios are now uh, synthesized into the training cases. And that's the cases where HMM are doing a little bit better. And here they are doing even worse than HMM. I bet you if you show a graph like this now in your SMLN submission, your paper will be rejected no matter what. Okay. That reminds me of the good golden days of research like 15 or 20 years ago where people are paying a lot more attention to the mathematical beauty and not to the clarity and to the potential of the model rather than a benchmark performance. Nowadays, people are really running all things against the benchmark and get a higher, higher number only to lead to one more paper and then no one else can repeat it or they cannot apply to other problems. This HMM and this uh, CRF actually are still right now the backbone you know, of uh, many machine algorithms, if not most. You know, that's why I gave you all these other examples about two-dimensional HMM for image, three-dimensional HMM for many other things. Okay. So if you look at the early paper, the first paper was a disaster. It was, it was uh, very hard to understand, first of all, and it doesn't give you good numbers. So what's the catch? I don't know. <laughs> I think people need to publish paper nowadays. But hopefully, at least for this class, to pass the class project to get a good score, I don't look for good numbers. Okay, I look for good formulation, clear design, and also understanding of what I'm doing, not for those benchmark numbers. So don't worry if you don't get good experimental results. All right, with that, I want to close and see you on Wednesday.